Good evening, everyone. Baruch Hashem, I have the zchut, the merit to be with you again, like last year, and many more years to come, Bezrat Hashem. We are a few days before Pesach. Pesach, the holiday of the freedom. We became free. The problem is, many people do not understand what it means to be free. What does it mean to be free? Sometimes a person is, is inside a jail, and a person is outside of a jail. The person inside the jail is more free than the person is on the street. Why? A person that is doing whatever he wants, he thinks, I'm free. Nobody tells me what to do. I eat whatever I want. I walk as much as I want. I do whatever I want. I'm free. He's in jail. They tell him, get up, sit down, don't eat, eat. He's not free. Right? What does Hashem say in the Torah? No, not like that. Free, it's a person that controls his desire. He's not an animal. Animals cannot control their desire. If a lion is hungry, he must attack the sheep. There's no way to convince him not to attack. No matter what you say to the lion, please don't do it, wait an hour, give us a chance, we'll get you something else. He doesn't understand. He's hungry, he must eat. No matter what you're going to do to prevent him, he'll try to do everything he can to eat. Even if he gets killed, he will eat and then get killed. Why? He's an animal. Dog, monkey, everyone the same. They live by instinct. They can control their desire. They have desire, and when they have the desire, nobody can stop them. Most of the people in the world, exactly the same. They're hungry, I have to eat. Relax, one hour you don't eat. No, no, no. Stop everything. Food. No, no, the food not ready. They get angry. Why the food is not angry? One hour he scream. He tells his wife, where is the food? What's going on here? She said, I can't take this. Rabbi, help me, save me. She's shaking. He comes home, hey, hey, the food is not ready. I'm going to kill me now. Why? He's an animal. He's not a person. He looks like a person, but he behaves like an animal. That's what the Torah says. Somebody like this is not free. The Yetzirah control him. The desire is like a boss that tells him what to do. I remember when I was young, my father got me a car. I was 17 years old. I needed to go to school. I needed to take two buses. It used to take me more than an hour in the morning. My father felt bad for me. He got me a car. In Israel, it's not like here. Car is cheap. You pay $2,000, you have a car. It's much, much more expensive. And the gas is double or triple than here. And the insurance is double. Very difficult over there. It wasn't easy for him to buy me a car, but he got me the car. First thing he told me when he got me the car, don't ever let anybody that you drive in your car leave cigarettes inside the car. I say to him, why? He say, because if somebody walk by and he needs a cigarette and he doesn't have, and he's going to see cigarettes inside, he'll break the glass and take the cigarette. I say to my father, are you serious? How much a cigarette costs? Two dollars? going to break the glass for this? He said, you don't understand what it means when a person needs a cigarette and he doesn't have. Baruch Hashem, you should never understand. But if a person needs it, he'll kill for it. He'll walk three hours for it. He'll go all over in the street like Meshuga. Please, you have cigarette, you have cigarette. You don't give him cigarette after the food, he can kill someone. So who is free? Someone like me that never touched a cigarette? and I don't let it control me, or someone who must have cigarettes every 10 minutes, who is free? He needs to go out 20 below zero, wind, oh, like this. Why? Miserable, like a drug addict. He doesn't have control. Someone needs alcohol. 
you see whiskey, can I? No, Moshe, don't touch, please. Last time you touch it, you make, you make embarrassment to your wife, to your children, to the family. You look, you broke glass, you fight with people. I saw many times. I went to places, wedding, this. Somebody drink a little bit too much. Somebody says something he doesn't like. Begin to scream, ruin the whole wedding. Later, tomorrow, he's going to see the video. 20 years, he's going to cry for the embarrassment he made. Why? So who is free? Someone that controls how much he drinks or someone that cannot control? So the Torah said to you, I put you in this world not to be an animal, to control yourself. Control, that's in English, it's called discipline. Now, the person control, he gets up on time, he starts his things on time, he prays on time, he walks on time, he eats on time. Everything in his life is, or, is in order. If he has order in his life, everything he does, he succeeds. If he doesn't have order, not one thing in his life, he can succeed. This is, by the way, also true, not, not only for religious people. By religious people, you see it more. But even not religious people, if they're serious, they get up early every morning, they go to work, they do things on time, everything by them, then they succeed. If not, one day like this, one day change his mind, one day try here, one day try there. After 40 years, nothing came out. He had a lot of ideas. Now, one thing he accomplished. Sometimes you see it in America, many of the kids go to college, go, stop one semester, Try again, stop again, try again, change to different college, change a different thing in the end. In the end, they don't get anything, and they have a $100,000 student loan. Do you know how many kids like this in the community call me? Do you have someone to help me to pay my student loan? How much you owe? Over 100000 I say, what did you learn that it's so expensive? He said, it's with the interest and this and that. And I said, okay, but don't you have a job? No, I don't have a job. Why? You went to college. Yeah, but I never finished. Yeah. What? You didn't finish college? You still have 100,000? Why it happened to him? He cannot control his desire. One day he wants to learn, two days he wants to sleep. He doesn't think what's going to happen tomorrow. You understand? Smart person doesn't learn on, his, on himself. He learns from other people's mistake. If you are 18 years old and you see somebody started to smoke drugs, you see two years later, it's already in heroin. You see another six months later, he begins to take needles. You see another two months later, he sleeps on the street. He goes to jail, he comes out, he goes to jail, he sleeps he sleep in a park, he goes on the street like this, help me. If you see somebody like this, you normal, you're going to touch it. If you have a brain, it's enough to see something like that once in your life, you never dare to, to try. No matter what it is, this is how I'm going to finish. All the people that begin to smoke, what do they say? Ah, Rabbi, it's light drugs. It's no big deal. It's legal in Denver. In Colorado, it's legal. It's legal over here. It's legal over there. Of course it's legal. Because the people that make it legal, they themselves use it. They also want to use it. So they make it legal. It doesn't, it doesn't make it right. It starts with that. Every heroin addict. Ask him, how did you start? Heroin is the last thing I tried. I tried this, and then I tried that, and then he moved me to that, and then he moved me to this, and then he moved me to needles. And I said, but you're not afraid of needles? Of course, I'm, I, I can, uh, when I look at needles, I'm dying. But that you cannot control it, and then your life finished. Same thing in religion. You learn 3,300 years of history. All the people who didn't listen to Hashem, one after the other, destroyed. One after the other. The Torah say, oh, your eyes saw all the people who went to bow down to Baal Peor. This Avodah Zarah of the Goim. Idols. They went there. All of them got destroyed. Smart person, he say, if somebody got destroyed over there, why should I go there? If you read in the Torah that there was one person, his name was Tzlofchad. One name is one person, his name was Tzlofchad. 
דה תורה זה, he was the first מחלל שבת. משה רבנו had to put him in jail, he didn't know what to do with him, he didn't know what to do with him. Hashem said to him, take him and kill him. Why? I want everybody to see, when you're not Shomer Shabbat, you don't deserve to live. Now, a smart Jew, that he reads this in a Torah, how can he be Mechalel Shabbat? Even he didn't go to the rabbi to teach him what to do on Shabbat. Just reading this in the Torah should have been enough to every Jew to know if Hashem say to kill a Jew for doing one time Chilul Shabbat, not every day, all the Shabbat, again and again and again. One time he picked up some straw from the floor on Shabbat, Hashem say kill him. And he wasn't Rasha, he was Tzadik. All his daughter was big Tzadikot. The Torah speaks about them. And he did one time Chilul Shabbat, no second chance. Hashem said, take him and kill him. I want everyone to see what's their end. Every Jew that reads it has to say, wait, that's what Hashem thinks about me. I'm not Shomer Shabbat. Hashem thinks about me, what he say about him. But I'm much worse than him. He did only once. I did one million times. One billion times already. 20, 30, 40. So if he got for one time such a punishment, what's going to be my end? Smart person doesn't wait to see what's going to happen to me. He changed when he see what happened to him. What happened to him? I said to one kid, don't drive without a license. But I drive perfect. I told him, don't drive. It doesn't pay. They're going to catch you. They're going to put you in jail. You're going to have to pay thousands of dollars to the lawyer. They're going to give you four, four or five tickets. They're going to give you all kinds of penalty. They suspend your license before you even got it. For one year at least. It's going to cost you such a damage. Yeah, 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 yeah. A few days later, handcuffs, police. Can you come help me to get on bail? No. Stay in jail, learn your lesson. We warn you from this. Now you call us to help you? Only a fool will help you. Stay over there. Be there for the weekend with all the people over there. I don't want to tell you who sits over there. You learn your lesson. Next time when we speak to you, make it come from the head, not from the legs. In Israel, in the army, they have a sentence. Ma'ashelo ba derech harosh ba derech haraglaim. What does not penetrate from the hand penetrates from the legs. Why they make you run all night? Why they make you run all night? Because when they told you first time you didn't listen, all night you run. Up, down, up. They put heavy things on your back. 60 seconds. Go. You, on, you made it 63 seconds. Come down again from the mountain. Ready? Again. Run. All night. Why? One minute you didn't listen. Five hours you run all night. Middle of the night. August. You made. Sometimes in the winter, freezing, winds, they don't care. Next time when we tell you first time, you will never tell us wait. You run to do it. You understand? That's the only way people understand. But smart person doesn't wait for the second time. He learned from the first time because he saw him and him and him and him. Why should I, do? Why should I suffer like them to know what I have to do? From them, I learned what not to do. You understand? This is what brings me here today to speak to you here. I know, already few people here I know, but I know that Baruch Hashem, all of you have good manners. You give respect, family, together. You have good values, Baruch Hashem. Most of the Bukharian people I met, 98% I'd say, nice people. They met nice people, they give respect. They're nice, they're generous, they try very nice, they very care about values. But this is a problem, and I tell you why it's a problem. When a person knows he's good, I'm good, I give donation, I respect, I am a good father, I work very hard for my family, you know, I, I'm not a criminal, I, you know, my, everybody's, you know, like me, everybody, nobody has what to say bad about me. It doesn't matter so much that I'm not so religious. Rabbi is not religious, but he's a good person. 
How many times you heard this in your life? Rabbi is a good person, but he's not religious. He's, a, he's, a, he's not religious, but he's a good person. How many yeah. times you heard it? Now I'll tell you something. There is no such thing as not religious, but he's a good person. It's a big lie. There's no such thing. It doesn't exist. And I'll tell you why it doesn't exist. If a kid is very bad to everybody, nasty kid, you talk to him, yeah, leave me alone. He cares, he steals, he hits people. He, you know, horrible kid. He's horrible to everybody, and he's also horrible to his parents. That's his nature. Very nasty, arrogant, bad person. That's how he is from, from young age. Nobody likes him. Everybody hates him. He has very horrible personality. And then there is another kid that is the nicest kid to the whole world, but is very, very bad to his parents. Which one of the two is worse? Second. Which one of the two is worse? First. Second. One person can say, wait a minute, Rabbi, this person is very, very bad to everybody. So he's worse. Wow. At least the other one is nice to many people. Then the other person say, no, excuse me, I disagree. If you're nice to all the people and you spit in your parents', fa in the parents fa face, then you are much worse than the first one. Why? The first one made his parents and strangers equal. He's garbage and they are garbage in his eyes. Even the person on the street and his father, for him is garbage, excuse me. Garbage and garbage, equal. But the second kid, everybody is important, but my father is garbage. So who is worse? Second is much worse. That's why a good person, and a lot of you for sure are good people in the heart, I know it. That's why I talk about this now. A good person to the whole world, but is bad to Hashem, is the worst. And he's going to get the biggest punishment. Why? Because Hashem said to him, why didn't you listen to me? He said, eh, Hashem, you know, I was lazy. Then Hashem said, wait, 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 lazy? You went 40 years to work, 4 o'clock in the morning you got up, you took the bus, you changed to the train, you went, you killed yourself to bring food for your children, to feed your wife, to help your brother, to help strangers. You were very good for them. Why they are more important than me? If you're lazy, you're lazy to everybody. You don't get up to work, you don't get up to go to the shul, okay? So you're lazy. But if you're very strong to everybody, but when it comes to me, you don't care, that means they're more important than me. You have a very big problem. You know, there's one mitzvah in the Torah. It's called mitzvah shiluah haken. You heard about it? You have mitzvah, you see a bird, Yona, in the nest. You take the chicks, the babies, you make the mother fly away. You take the kids, you put them somewhere, they die. You leave them there, they'll die. The mother comes back to the nest, goes crazy. Where is the babies? And makes the mother very sad. We see that animals care very much about their babies. All animals. So a person that does this mitzvah, he asks himself, why Hashem made such a mitzvah in the Torah? Why? Who this mitzvah help? Does it help anybody? It helps people? No. It helps my name? No. It helps Hashem? No. Who does it help? What's good in this? Everything we do, we're looking for some logic here. Why Hashem made such a mitzvah? The answer is, listen carefully, the answer is when a person does this mitzvah, he feels horrible in his heart, right? You feel very bad. Why am I doing this? Ah, what a mitzvah. Why you made such a mitzvah, Hashem? Why? Well, what can I do? The Torah says to do, I have to do. But you feel very bad about it. Sometimes even a week you feel bad. Every time you pass by that place, ay, 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 look what I've done here. I put the chicks here to die. Some people even go and check how they feel. <laughs> yeah, it bothers them very much. One day a person dies, and he comes in front of Hashem, 
and Hashem show him the day that he did this mitzvah. And Hashem will show him how horrible he feel in his heart when he did that mitzvah, when he, how he felt. And then Hashem will say to him, tell me, why did you feel so bad here? He said, because I felt bad for the children and for the mother. So Hashem would ask him, why you never felt about me like this all your life? All my children, the Jewish people, are all over the world. They marry the goyim. They don't keep Shabbat. They don't put filin. They don't come to shul. They steal. They do all kinds of bad things. Not one time you felt bad for me like this. My children are all gone. They all disappear. They all marry the goyim. They lost their Judaism. You don't cry. They ask you, give money. Maybe we save some Jews. You don't care. Now you got rid of the bird, you cry. For the babies of the bird, you cry. But for me, you don't care. This is what's going on here. When you are good, you have to start from the one you owe him the most. And then the second. So the first one is Hashem. Then your parents. Then all the other people in the world that help you. If you have a rabbi, then he comes before your parents. Then you have Hashem. And the rabbi that told you Torah, and then your parents, and then maybe your uncle or your best friend, everybody who help you in life. Why the rabbi come before the parents? Why? The rabbi, you see, two, three hours a day in yeshiva, and he teach you Torah five, six, seven years. And then you move on with your, your parents, your parents all your life. Why the rabbi come before them? The answer, the Gemara say. Your parents brought you to this world. How long is this world? 80, 90 years finished. Your rabbi bring you to Olam Abba, to the next world, which is billions of years. Who do you owe more? Your rabbi taught you how to keep Shabbat, how to put filin, emunah, about Hashem, about Torah Shebe'al Peh, about holidays, about all the halachot, talit, filin, tefillah. This is the things that are the most important in life. Thanks to what he taught you, you go to Olam Abba. But if your father is also a rabbi, and your father, then he comes before your rabbi in school. Why? Because he also taught you also Torah, plus he's your father, so he has two against one. But if your father doesn't know Torah, very nice. It's still very important, but the rabbi comes before him. Meaning, if your father tells you one thing to do, and your rabbi says, you're not allowed to do this, it's against the Torah, <coughs> you're not allowed to listen to your father. And by that, you're actually respecting your father. Why? Because if you listen to him, he's going to get punished. If you love your father, you don't want your father to get punished. Right? If your father speaks to you on the phone, and you know the FBI is listening, and your father tells you on the phone, I want you to go kill this guy, Itzik. Do it for me, I'm your father. He made me a lot of problems. Go kill him. Now you know the FBI is listening. You're going to do it? No. You know if you do it, your father's going to go to jail. Right? So, so you say, why you don't listen to your father? Because I love you. If I didn't love you, then I would listen to you. But because I love you, I don't want you to suffer. That's why I don't listen to you. If you knew Torah, you would never tell me to do this. You don't know Torah, so you tell me to do this. How many Jews in the world, and I speak about it almost in every one of my lectures, every time I know there is one person in a place that doesn't keep Shabbat, I speak about it. Why it's so important to speak about it? I'll tell you why. How many Jews in the world would, would agree to kill a baby, a Jewish baby, one years old, sleeping in his crib, crying, you take him, you put the pillow on his face and choke him, and I'll give you $100,000 cash. Do you agree to do it or no? Okay, I'll make it $200,000. I'll pay a whole mortgage. If the bank sent you now that if you don't pay the mortgage next week, they take away your home, and I come and I offer you to kill that baby, and the bank would leave you alone, would you do it? Why? But you're going to be on the street. The answer, better to be on the street all your life than to kill an innocent baby, right? 
What if I tell you that to do one time Chilul Shabbat, you light fire like this, or you turn this light on, or you start the car, or you sew, or you write, or you type on a computer, all these things, turn television on. It's a much bigger crime than to kill this baby in a Torah. Why you do it for free? I don't understand. If $200,000 cannot convince you to save your home, and you're going to freeze on the street with your children, you have to knock on your friend's door, please, can you give us the basement to sleep? We don't have a place to live. You have to call people, you put one kid over here, you put the girl over there. Horrible life. I say, come on, here, go. I'll show you where to kill the guy. Nobody will ever know. It's a baby, nobody is there, I'll give you the key, you go in, in and out, no one would ever know. 200,000, your problem is over. What would you say? i rather die and I don't do it. And if you say it, that's because you're a good person. Why? Because a, a good person doesn't murder innocent baby or anybody. You don't kill someone. But why when it comes to Shabbat? Uh, Start the car, no problem, Bechlal. Why you go cut hair all day in a barber shop for hundred dollars all day? All day, Mechalel Shabbat. Like this. One, two, five, hundred, five hundred. Each time it's death penalty. One, pe death penalty. Again, death penalty. The machine, death penalty. Again, cut, pe death penalty. The razor. All these things on Shabbat, death penalty, in one haircut could be 300 death penalty. And each one will be in the next world, one after the other. Not one of them goes off. One Bukharian barber can have already millions of death penalties, unless if he does tshuva. And how much he got for this death penalty? A few hundred dollars. Smart or stupid? Who thinks he's smart? So why you don't run and scream to him? Huh? Why you don't run and scream to him? You have to run and scream to him, Moshe, I'm begging you, don't be Mechalel Shabbat, it doesn't pay. If you have the money, it's better for you to give him the $100 to stay home. Why? If you care about him, you save him. Because the, whatever they pay him in a barber shop is very stupid for that to lose his eternity. But most of the people do not understand because they don't learn Torah. How do you know that Mechalel Shabbat is a bigger crime than a murderer? How do you know? You see what the punishment HaKadosh Baruch Hu gave to Mechalel Shabbat and what punishment he gave to murderer. If the punishment of the murderer is worse, then to murder it's a bigger crime. If the punishment of Mechalel Shabbat is worse, then that's, what, that's a bigger crime. How many times Shabbat is mentioned in the Torah? Twelve times. How many times you should not kill? Three times. Twelve times Mechalel Shabbat. When a Jew is a murderer, he kills people every day. Every day he kills one person. You know, hitmen. Go, one. Five hours later, boom, another one. Tomorrow, another two. Very bad person, right? One day he die, you still consider him as a Jew if he was Shomer Shabbat. Murderer, but Shomer Shabbat is a very bad Jew, but he's a Jew. Murderer, but a Jew. The biggest thief, like Madoff, if he Shomer Shabbat, he stole 60 billion people, he's still a Jew. But a Jew that doesn't steal, and doesn't kill, and is so nice, and so polite, and so generous, and kiss the mezuzah 50 times a day, and donates Sefer Torah to Shul, and does a lot of nice things, but is not Shomer Shabbat, is 100% Goy in a Torah. When he die, you cannot bury him in a Jewish cemetery. Not allowed. You have to make a wall and bury him on the other side of the wall. And if by mistake they bury him in a Jewish cemetery, you have to open the grave, take him out of there, and move him out of the cemetery. You're not allowed to keep him over there. That's the Jewish law. Now, I want you to tell me, after you hear this, how would you ever think to be Mechalel Shabbat? Do you know what a horrible scene is this? 
So the answer is, no matter even if you make a million dollar cash, you don't ever be Michalel Shabbat. Friday, you come early, you don't kill yourself at work, you close one, two, three maximum. You come home, you relax, you prepare for Shabbat, go to mikveh if you can, take a shower, get dressed in the nicest clothes, prepare your children, come to the shul, pray, meet family, friends in the shul, come home, make a beautiful meal, sit with your wife and your children, let the children say divrei Torah, you say divrei Torah, you bring guests, friends, neighbors, cousins, you sit, you enjoy Shabbat, you sing a little bit, you drink lechaim a little bit, Shabbat, it's like a holiday. The morning, you go to shul again, you listen to Torah, the rabbi give a speech, again you meet friends, you come home, you eat again, wonderful osvo, the, the sticky one, the wet one, you know, gujguje and chulen, whatever you want. You enjoy, not too much, you don't want to get too heavy, but you enjoy, then you say divrei Torah, then you go to sleep a little bit, you relax, then you go again, you meet your friends in shul, and then you eat again, beautiful, like a holiday. And for that, you get a huge sachar from Hashem, huge reward. What are you losing? I don't understand. You go to work, excuse my language, like a dog. It's enough. You work six, six days. You want to work on Shabbat also with your slave? Even slaves have a day off. Everywhere in the world, somebody gets day off. Even in the army. We were slaves in the army. One day we had off. They want to take advantage on us. But then one day they give you rest. And the army is not religious. The army is not religious. They do whatever they want. They turn the electric, whatever, but Shabbat, you don't work. They go in, they take a day off. Everybody has a day off, but a Jew, seven days a week. Yom Kippur also got to work. Rabbi, they pay double. <laughs> Why? Person doesn't appreciate how much Hashem does for him. One more thing. Today in the world, there is a big problem. What is the big problem? It's the internet. The internet is a very big problem. Internet can be used for good things. You can learn Torah. You can learn all kinds of things from the internet. If people will use the internet only in a kosher way, it would be the greatest thing in history. The greatest. The problem is that the reality shows that 80% of the things that are done on the internet, it's bad. It's against Hashem. And 20% that done in the internet is good. So if you know that you invest in a stock that 8 out of 10 times you lose, 2 times you win. Would you put your money over there? No. You can't. Would you give it to your children? If he goes and listens to one shiur. Here, I, I show you, I just got an email from Israel. One woman wrote to me an email from Israel. She said to me, Rabbi, tell me what I should do. What I should do, what I should do. She said, I have a, not, I have, she said, I have a, I have a phone, and I'm listening to your lectures on my phone. The only problem is that it also brings me to places I'm not supposed to go as a religious <coughs> woman. <coughs> what should I do? <coughs> what should I do? Should I keep it because I listen to your lectures there, but I also go to website and see things that I'm not supposed to, or I should cancel the phone? What would you say? The answer is, we have a rule. Mitzvah abaa be'avera ena mitzvah. Mitzvah that you do, but it comes with a sin, it's not a mitzvah. If you steal from your friend $100 and you give it to the poor person on the street, it's not mitzvah. You don't have mitzvah. It's not your money, and you stole the money. It's not mitzvah. Many of the things that we do, it comes with a sin, with avera. For instance, to get married, it's mitzvah or avera? Depends how you do it. To get married, it's mitzvah. But if you make a mixed wedding, Men, women, everybody comes open, touch, kiss each other, become drunk. 
bad music, non-Jewish music, it becomes like a nightclub. That's a very, very big scene. It's no mitzvah in that wedding. Only sins, no mitzvah at all. Zero mitzvah. Millions of sins, zero mitzvah. And you pay $200,000. Beautiful flowers. Great band from Uzbekistan. Yeah. What's going to happen? This bismoishmo will cost millions of dollars in Olam Ava. Why? Akarosh Baruch Hu doesn't like. Mwah, mwah, mwah. You know what I want. Doesn't like this. It's against the Torah. Noah and his son, when they walk in a teva, they had one door. The women, family, rabbi, family, rabbi, family. What? We're not stranger. It's my uncle. It's my cousin. It's my father. It's my grandfather. My, I cannot kiss my cousins. Cousins get married. Cousins have desire for each other. What do you mean, my cousin? Cousin is a stranger, ma. If you like him, you want to marry him. <laughs> what does Torah say not to get in touch before you get married? Because it makes the mind think things that Hashem doesn't want you to think. It's a divine neshama in the mind. What do you think? So grandmother, fine. Your mother, fine. Your daughter, fine. But that's it. Sister, if she's single, no. Better not to. But if she married, finish. She belongs to another man. Sister. You don't do these things. The Arabs from the Hamas knows it. We're not going to know it. The murderers that kill our children, they know it. Did you ever see a mixed wedding by the Hamas? There was one. Do you know what happened? They came with jeeps and they killed everybody. In the middle of the wedding. Go on the internet, you see it. Google. Google Hamas wedding. Who saw it? Who saw it that they came with the jeep and they... And you know what? It wasn't a mixed wedding. The man was dancing over there and the women in a different place. But because they play music, play music. They came and shot all of them and killed them. I'm not saying that's what you have to do. That's murder. What are you, murdering people? No. But I'm just showing you that these monsters that are the worst people in history... They understand about modesty better than people who go to yeshiva. How can it be? What's wrong here? Doesn't make sense, ma. This Ahmed Yassin Sheikh cover his head like the Baba Sali and every day tell to kill children? He's going to have more tzniu than us? He's not going to go where the ladies in and we're going to go? What's wrong here? Rabbi, this is how we are already. You know, we came... A family like this? No, 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 no. It doesn't matter family like this. It's only what Hashem says in the Torah. Does Hashem say it's kosher? You do it. It's not kosher. You're not allowed to do it. So that's why people make scenes in the internet. And there's all kinds of other, you know, one thing leads to another. The next thing he does when he goes home, he makes more scenes. And then he destroyed his olam haba. And then one day, we have to gather together and make askara for him and beg Hashem to have mercy on him. Why? Why you want to be counting on people? You can save yourself. Im en anili mili, the Gemara say. If I don't take care of my soul, who's going to take care of me? I'm going to count on my uncles to do your side for me? Askara? To bring a little bit uh, ashfolo? That's going to save me in Olam Ava. Better I'm going to be Shomer Shabbat. I'll dress nice. I'll be modest. I'll keep Tarat Mishpacha. I give tzedakah. I pray. I come to shul. I don't steal. I watch my mouth. I watch my eyes. That's what, that's what saved me. Nothing else would save me. I want you to know one thing. You do one million askarot like this. One million. Which each one probably costs two, three thousand dollars just the food. Right? Maybe more even. One million askarot cannot cover one Chilul Shabbat. One time he lights a cigarette. One million times cannot cover one cigarette on Shabbat. That's what people don't understand. They think it's a joke. But we don't want to be later on depending on our children to help us. I promise you it's the last thing you want. You want when you get there that you're going to be in a good condition. The little that you need, they can do for you. But if you did nothing, what's going to happen? What's going to happen? And this is the future of these children. One more thing before we finish. Some people say to me, Rabbi, 
We don't have money to send the kids to yeshiva. What do you think? We don't want to put them in yeshiva? Of course we want to put them in yeshiva. But after all the discount, they say $500 for kid. I have three kids, $1,500 a month. I can do it. What do you think about this? They right or no? The answer, they're not right. They're wrong. And I'll tell you why they're wrong. If chas shalom, God forbid, the kid would have kidney failures, and he needs to get a kidney. And a kidney in a black market to get is $150,000, right? So if it's $1,500, if it's $500 to send the kid to yeshiva, it's 6,000 a year. 6,000 years, after 10 years, it's 60 years. Uh, 60,000. After 20 years, it's 120,000. 25 years from the day he was born, you send him to yeshiva, he got married, you can still continue to pay for his yeshiva, all his life is less than one kidney. Why kidney you gonna run and borrow and work extra hours and you know beg people, knock on door, please help me, have mercy, I have, I have to save my kid. My kid doesn't have kidneys. If, if we're not gonna get him a kidney, he'll die in two months. Please help me out. He gives you a thousand, he gives you five hundred, he gives you eight hundred. You run, you're not embarrassed. You come in a wedding, excuse me, ladies and gentlemen. You know, there's somebody that we collect money for tzedakah. You don't say it's for yourself. Somebody that wants to put his kid in yeshiva and we cannot afford. Please help. And everybody gives. For kidney, everyone will do it. Nobody will let the kid die. The only problem is that to take a kid and put him in public school, every minute of his life, you're murdering this kid. You're putting him over there with Muhammad, with Lee, with the Korean, with the Puerto Rican, with the American, with the Nazi, with all these people, who all, almost all of them hate Jews, and they hate Hashem, almost all of them, and they have nothing, no kdusha whatsoever. They speak dirty, they dress dirty, they don't have faith, they steal, they bully, they have guns, they have whatever you want they have. They make tattoos, they have crazy haircuts, they use drugs, almost all of them. That's where you put your kid, are you normal? If they offer me a million dollar a day cash to put my son or my daughter in this place, one million cash on the table per day, I swear on my life I would not do it. For a million dollar cash a day, I would not agree. One day is there, he's gone, you're killing him. What he sees around, how they talk how they touch each other, the things that they do, the things that they have in the things that they're showing your kids. You have to kill yourself before you do such thing. Do you know what a murder is this? The Gemara says, Gadol HaMachtiyo Yoter Min HaOrgo. He's talking to me about $500 a month? Go and knock on doors. Mr. Richman, help me out. I cannot put my kids in yeshiva. Don't tell me no. This kid is Hashem's kid. You have to care about him. Help me out. You get a little bit embarrassment. Hashem will give you a big sachar in Olam Abba, that you made yourself bushot, shame, to save this kid and send him to yeshiva. If you really want, you save him to yeshiva. Many of the people say, we're well, rabbi, we cannot afford. They have a lot of money in their bank account. It's all lies. They have money. They drive nice cars sometimes too. They have all kinds of things in the house that it's not important. They go on vacation. They go to Israel twice a year. Every bar mitzvah, they fly to Arizona, to Miami. What for? Don't go. It's not important. You call your uncle or your cousin, forgive me. I cannot afford to bring my wife and the two children and pay $2,000 for the tickets. Why? There is a bigger mitzvah now. If I'm going to come to your bar mitzvah, my kid will go to public school. I'm going to murder my kid because I want to come drink lechaim with you in Arizona? Where is the, uh, the brain of the people here? Nobody is allowed to send these kids to public school. And if they are in public school, don't send them tomorrow morning. Don't. Move them out right after Pesach to yeshiva. And if the yeshiva doesn't want to accept them, don't leave the room. Cry. The, the women, they're good with that. Cry and pull your hair off and say, please, I'm begging you. I'm not leaving this place until you put my kids in yeshiva. 
If they cannot put them in their yeshiva, they'll find your yeshiva, don't worry. If they see you really care, some people go, okay, so what's your name? Da, da, da. So you want to put your kids in yeshiva? We don't have room. Okay, goodbye. No, no, no. If it's a boat to save you from hell. Boat! Now you have to go from uh, Germ Nazi Germany to America. There's only 50 places on a boat. Everybody wants to get on a boat. They tell you we don't have room for you. What do you say? Okay, I stay with Adolf here. <laughs> it doesn't work this way. You pull, you kill. You pull, you throw somebody else. You get on a boat. You don't want to stay there. You come to Yeshiva and say, we don't have room. There's no such thing, we don't have room. You get me. I don't get me. Sometimes it's worth it to keep the kid one year behind, as long as they get him in, but as long as in Yeshiva. And you know what? If you did not find him Yeshiva, keep him home. Keep him home. Better he doesn't go to school. I know what you're thinking. What is he talking about? I want my son to be a doctor. Before he will be a doctor, or a lawyer, or whatever he's going to be, he's already going to marry Goya, he's going to be a drug addict, he's going to make tattoos, he's going to be a thief, or maybe he's going to end up in jail. That's much bigger chance until he will be a doctor. And then if you be a doctor, do you think he's going to be religious? How many of the kids from the community that went to college stay religious? 5%? Check them all out. All the educated ones, they all became Mechalelei Shabbat. Some of them marry Goim. Some of them do the worst thing you can think of. I know, I deal with these people. The more educated they are, the more they hate Torah. The more they don't care about religion, and they make fun at rabbis. Who got them to make fun at rabbis? The gay professor in a university. <laughs> oh, your rabbi. Who is your rabbi? We are in the 21st century. In a billion years, he won't be the dirt of the nail of the rabbi. What does he know, this professor, from his life? But they think they know something. This is the mistake here. And the problem here that some of the rabbis here in the community are snoring. Instead of screaming about this every day in the shuls to shake the people. You know, some places, if your kids go to public school, they won't let you come into the shul. By the Hasidim? If you say, I don't want to pay yeshiva, I'm going to take my kids out of your cheder and put them in public school, you're done. You cannot come to the shul, nobody will ever marry you, nobody will step into your store, nobody will say hello to you. You walk in the street, everyone will walk out. Why? Because they understand what it means to be a real criminal. And someone that put his kids in public school, excuse me for telling you the truth, is a very, very big criminal. Maybe he doesn't do it intentionally. Maybe he doesn't understand what he does to his children. That's why he needs people like me to tell him the truth in his face. And if you're honest, you don't get angry. You go home, you cry tonight for all the years that they were in public school. And you say, I must fix it tonight, not tomorrow, tonight. Because by tomorrow morning, you already forget about it. Everything now you think is right, is right. I better do it. If I don't do it now, when will I do it? Tomorrow, 2 o'clock. Tomorrow afternoon, you won't remember a word. Now you have to accept to make the decision. If you're not Shomer Shabbat, you say now, when soon as I get out of this door, you say to your wife, this Shabbat we're keeping no matter what. We're going to keep it. And if we don't know how to keep, we'll go to family that keeps. Right? Avram Shimonov, is the number one person. You just tell him you want to keep Shabbat, he'll find your place. Why? He cares about other Jews all the time. All the time. Care about these, give CDs to these, give to that. If Avram Shimonov would be a millionaire, I wouldn't have to ever speak about tzedakah. <laughs> I would only go to him. Avram, I need a million for this. Avram, half a million for that. He wouldn't say no. He said to me, you know what? Why don't you ask me? Take the account information and take from there. <laughs> Yeah, but the people that have this heart, unfortunately, don't have the billions yet. But that's okay. Better to have Olam Abba with no money than lots of money with no Olam Abba. All the people are not Shomer Shabbat and drive a beautiful Mercedes, feel bad for them. Because the Torah says, before I clean a person for eternity, I pay him in this world. 
If I love you and you tzaddik, I don't pay you in this world. I keep your sachar for Ulam Abba. It's written in the Torah. End of parashat va'et chanaan. Three psukim. Ani el kana meshalem la rasha el panav la avido. Lo ha'acher le shalem lo el panav ha shalem lo la avido. One more thing, if you have teenagers, you have to be very, very concerned about them because there's a problem in Queens that a lot of these teenagers are addicted to drugs. And many of the parents, because they never touch drugs and they never saw what drugs is, they don't know what's going on here. Hundreds of hundreds of hundreds of kids walk here with yamaka on their head and they're addicted to heroin. And they don't get up and they sleep and they have all kinds of moody things, and the parents don't understand what's going on. The problem is, usually it comes from public school. And even if they go to yeshiva, it can come from the streets. There is a problem. There's a problem in this world. Like Satan is very, very strong. If the kids have access to movies, they see things on the internet. In one week, from a bachur yeshiva, he become a rapper, a black rapper. A hat like that, I don't want to tell you. Then he makes himself a stupid beard like this, like a fool, you know? And the parents don't understand what happened to my son. I'll tell you what happened. Two weeks, he's on the internet, that's enough. From Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, he became Titus. <laughs> Why? Rap music. Rap music. That's what happened to these children. Rabbi, but my son doesn't let go. I have to get him a phone. You know, in internet, if you walk with the iPhone, you're a criminal. I have a proof right now. I went with Rasher Milame to Rav Ovadia Yosef. I told him, take pictures over there. When we were there inside davening with him, he said to me, you know, if I pull my iPhone over there, they kill me over there. <laughs> the people over there. Right or wrong? Happen or not? Here, he's standing right here. I lost the picture with Rav Ovadia because in Israel you cannot take your American iPhone out. Because someone may scream, Poshea, he takes it away and breaks it. And you cannot charge him for the money. And in Israel, it costs double the nil. If here it's 500, it's 1,000 over there. Mm -hmm. Somebody, the Psak Alacha, somebody see you with that, he already knows that assuming that you go to non kosher things on it, all these internet phones, he can grab it from your hand, break it, and say, Sue me. And, the, and he comes to Bedin. The rabbi will say, Chazaku Baruch, go find some other ones and break. <laughs> <laughs> right? That's what it is. <laughs> ay, 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 ay. No, let's give time for questions before we finish. Any questions? No questions? Baruch Hashem. Ah, uh, uh. uh, one more thing. Shh. Okay, we'll, we'll speak five more minutes and we we'll finish. Today, there's a problem. Why is the problem? Many of the kids, even though they're good kids in general, they don't know how to respect parents. First, nobody ever told them enough the importance of how important it is to respect the parents. The Gemara is full of examples, the biggest rabbis in the world, how they used to stand on four that the mother step with her leg on their back that she can go up to the bed. A rabbi, imagine now, try to imagine that you see somebody like Chacham Ovadia, Zecher Tzadik Livracha, he goes like this on four, and he lets his mother put her leg on his back, that she can go on a bed. If you see something like this, you say, oh, Rabbi, please get up. What are you doing? So why? It's a very big mitzvah for me, that I respect my... One of the rabbis was big rabbi and a millionaire. And he walked like this, he puts his hands like this, and his mother step. Then he put another one. That's how they used to respect their parents. The Gemara brings an example from a goy that was respecting his, pa his father. The rabbis needed a stone from the Kohen Gadol on the Choshen. There was one stone that fell out, Shevet Binyamin. It's called Yashfe. Very expensive, like ruby, but big ones. Big, like 10, 20 carats, big stone. Worth today millions and millions. They went all over. They found one guy that had the Dama Ben Natina that has a jewelry store. They come and they say to him, how much? He says, yes, I have that stone that you're looking for. 
How much? Let's say the price is $100,000. You give him a price, and he says, okay, well, let me go get it. He comes back after two minutes, I'm sorry, I cannot sell it to you. They already knew he wants more money. That's how they thought. Okay, okay, we'll give you more. 120,000. No, no, 150. Just go get it first. No, no, 200,000. Okay, half a million. Get it. They must get it. They have no any price. They must get the stone. No, 10 million. Just get it. No, I can't. They don't let him talk. They're so nervous. Finally, they found one stone. The next day, they say to them, listen, you have to go get it no matter what. They come to him and say, why don't you want to sell us the stone? Tell us how much we'll pay you. Yeah, you can have the stone now. Here is the stone. How much? 100,000. They already got to 10 million with him. 100,000. So what is this? What happened? He said, that was the price I asked. So why didn't sell us yesterday? We had 100,000. He said, because my father was sleeping with his head or with his legs on a box. I didn't want to wake him up. I didn't want to wake up my father for millions of dollars. The Gemara said Hashem made him a nest. That night he had a red cow. Red cow worth billions. Somebody has red cow today, he can say two billion dollars, the Jews will have to pay him. No chance. No other choice. You have to get it. Any price he wants, he can ask. So he became a millionaire because of that. Why? <coughs> so now the question is, why Hashem paid the Goy something that worth billions, to show you that even a goy, that it's not so important by him like by the Jews. He did this mitzvah of respecting his father, and Hashem gave him such a big reward. A Jew that has an obligation, chayab, to respect his parents, imagine how much he's going to get in Olam Abba. If the goy that was not obligated, he got such a sachar, a Jew that must respect his parents, how much Hashem will give him. But everything in a Torah that has a very big reward also have a very big punishment when we don't do it. Limut Torah keneged kulam, bitul Torah keneged kulam. You give tzedakah to the right place, huge, huge reward. You give it to the wrong place, huge punishment. You give it to a good kosher yeshiva, yud sachar. You open a nightclub in Manhattan, horrible punishment. Same amount of money, for good or for bad. We see from here that the bigger the mitzvah is, it's very difficult to keep. But when you keep, Hashem gives you yud sachar. But when you don't do it, it's a very big problem. That's why I say, for those here that doesn't keep Shabbat. I was now in Toronto, Canada. I went there for one day. We, we went there Thursday. We came back Friday. I arrived home Shah before Shabbat. One hour before Shabbat. I gave two lectures over there. One started at 8, finished at 11 something. Then I went to another place. I started at 12 o'clock at night. Midnight. The house was packed more than here. Look how many people here. More people than here stood stay there until 3.30 a.m. And the second lecture, since it's more like in a house, always is better. The first lecture was hundreds of people. It's hard to communicate with all the people. But the second lecture is more like a family. I spoke and spoke and spoke. Some of the non Shomrei Shabbat the next day came to the place and kept the Shabbat, whole Shabbat. One lecture. The next day, they already sent me, they're all coming for Shabbat. And that's it. Few of them will always remain now Shomrei Shabbat. Mm -hmm. Why? Because they got the point. How many Jews know that Mechalel Shabbat is a bigger crime than a murder? How? If they all know, two more million Israelis will be Shomer Shabbat tomorrow. But no rabbi in the world dare to say it in speech. They're afraid. Thank you. Because they say, you know, it's, you're crazy. You're comparing Mechalel Shabbat to murder? What do I care what you think? I only care what the Torah say. You have something against what I say? Bring it. Show me where in the Torah it say different. I speak from the Torah, not from my heart. I speak what the Torah say. You want to speak from your feeling? From what they taught you in Russia? From what they teach you in a university in Israel? You bring your sources from there, I bring it from the Torah. When I, write, when I read Mechalel Shabbat Mot Yumat, it's in the Torah or no? It's in the Torah. 
The Gemara says, "Mot ba'olam azeh yumat ba'olam aba." Will die in this world and in the next world. Yes. The Torah says, "I'm gonna cut that soul out of the next world for eternity." It says. Does it say in the Gemara in the Shulchan Aruch, "Mechalel Shabbat is 100% like a goy"? Yes. Does it say that you cannot bury him in a Jewish cemetery? Yes. Does it say if he touch the wine, you have to put the wine in a garbage? Yes. If he's, if he's a witness in your wedding, you're not married. You have to get married again. It says all these things. So what are you answering? I don't understand. Why are you even opening your mouth? Why you open your mouth? Why people open their mouth? If people that don't keep Shabbat argue, I understand. It's when you come to a person that smokes cigarette, you tell him, don't smoke, it's very bad. No, no, it's not so bad. No, no, it's, it's killing. No, no, but it's also a good thing about it. Why? Because he doesn't want to stop. Mechalel Shabbat, he doesn't want to close his business on Shabbat. I understand at least why he argue. But why rabbis argue? Rabbis argue. Don't say this. It's too much. Do you know when we, when we convert goyim, when they become Jewish, Rabbi Eliyahu ben Chaim the Bedin, I bring many goyim to convert. After 99% of them, we don't approve. The 1% we approve, that's only when they're already Haredim 100%. Learning, cover, nida, if they marry, nida, everything. Kosher, limut Torah, listening two years of lectures non-stop. They know all the things that a Jew must know. Most Jews don't know what they learn to become Jewish. First thing we do to them, always Rav Eliyahu ben Chaim. So you know now, if now you mechalel Shabbat, nothing can happen to you. After you go into the mikveh and come out, you're going to do all the things that you mentioned you're not allowed to do on Shabbat. You deserve death penalty. You sure you want to be a Jew? That's the first thing you tell them. Why you don't tell them, you know, you have to be careful not to be mechalel Shabbat, have to love Hashem, you're going to die. That's what they said to the Goyim. You sure you want it? Think again. Maybe you go back and, and come back next month. Think about it. Think before you do that. It could be a big mistake. No, no, we want it. You should see how they cry. Every one of these Goyim, before they went into the mikveh, they couldn't say the bracha because they were crying that now they have the schut to be Shomrei Shabbat. And Jews that are Jews from birth, they, eh, it's too difficult, Rabbi Kasheli, it's cigarettes, the business, you know. He come from Korea, he wants to be a Jew. I do whatever, is, whatever Hashem say. He come from who knows where, Canada, Puerto Rico, China, everywhere. They want to be Shomrei Shabbat when they don't have to. And we that have to, we're not going to be Shomrei Shabbat? Every one of your grandparents in Uzbekistan, in Bukhara, in Iran, in all those places, 50 years ago, 70 years ago, you put a gun to their head and tell them, light fire on Shabbat. Kill me, kill me. I'm sorry, kill me. No, no, light fire, we don't kill you. No, no, kill me. Then I'm going to agree. My grandmother, Alea Shalom, on Yom Kippur, she fell from the second floor of the ladies. She was maybe eight years old. Eight years old, very old woman. She fell and rolled down the stairs, bleeding from the head. Yom Kippur! She was still unconscious. They said to him, we're going to take you to the hospital. But you know, back in the days, you couldn't drive in Israel in Yom Kippur. People used to throw stones at you. Today, maybe they look at you bad, but some people don't even care. But back in the days, we're talking to you about more than 30 years ago, you drive in your car on Yom Kippur, pikuach nefesh, life freeze, nobody cares, they throw stones at you. The non-religious Jews would throw stones at you. Because the religious Jews are all in shuls. They're not in the street. I'm talking the ones that are not Shomrei Shabbat. They take stones and throw at you. You drive on Yom Kippur, but they don't know that to drive on Shabbat is a million times worse than to drive on Yom Kippur. They don't know. He throw at him stones because he drives on Shabbat, because he drives on Yom Kippur. But the person that throw the stones is much worse than him. He drives on Shabbat. Shabbat is a covenant with Hashem. Yom Kippur, it's not a covenant with Hashem. So what happened? She refused to get on the car. My uncle, Alava Shalom, he says, Safta, we have to take you to the hospital. She's, she, all she cared, not about the pain. She, Kippur, she was screaming, Kippur. 
אני לא יודע הלכה, פיקוח נפש, כיפור, שבת, יום מס גדי נקר. Not to get in a car it's a sin. If you say no, no, I don't get in a car, but you can die, you must get to the hospital. But you know, the old people, they didn't know, they came back from the country, they didn't know how to read, to write. They didn't know so much. All they knew is what the rabbi was talking in the shul, that's it. From the, list, from the speeches. She refused to get on a car, only when she passed out, they took her to the hospital, and three days later she passed away. But she didn't give up. She refused to get on a car. And people today with their big belly, no problem, get in a car, Shabbat, Yom Kippur, nobody care. See that, making fun. You know, in Israel, the Chilonim, they have a beautiful sentence. They made a beautiful sentence. One, if I could, I would, I would add that to Pirkei Avot. I would enter it in Pirkei Avot. What did they write? Tzohek mi shetzohek acharon. You can laugh now. It doesn't matter now. It matters who would laugh in the end. Now they drive, they enjoy, shish kebab, steak, kaduregel, games, going, picnic, Shabbat. Eh, Rabbi, crazy Shabbat. <laughs> but next world, they're going to say, oh, why do we have to pay for all this? If a Jew in Israel drives now with his kids to picnic on Shabbat, goes to places, get, go on a bus, go on a train, whatever the case is. If he knew that for every hour he has to pay one million dollars, would he go on a picnic? If he was already on a bus, would he enjoy the trip? He can enjoy, <laughs> pay a million dollars an hour. But the payment in Olam Abba is much, much, much worse than, than a million dollars. So I want to say, first again, I want to say, I want to say before we finish, so the kids that we say over here, they have to understand to respect your parents is a very, very important thing. They will give you blessing in your life. Later, when you have children, they'll, they'll also respect you. You don't respect your parents, you think you know better than them, your kids will do the same thing to you. <coughs> One more thing I want to say. There is a problem in our community. More and more kids, teenagers, marry non-Jews. They say he's a very good person. And maybe they're right. Maybe he's a very good person, this guy. He can be good heart. Maybe he loves Hashem. Maybe he loves the Jewish people. Maybe he is generous. He gives money to the poor. Maybe he never steal. Maybe he's better than any Jew that you know in a whole Queens. I agree, maybe. Possible. There's very good going in the world, with great heart. <sighs> now, the worst Jew in the history, the worst, the head of the mafia, stole $60 billion and made thousands of Jewish families miserable, like Madoff. Drug dealer, Mechalel Shabbat. Thief, every second word is a curse. Dress like a monkey. Very, very bad person. Nobody can look at him. Everybody hates him. But he, need, he wants to marry the best Goya in the world. Goya, you know what Goya? 100% Sadika. Good, pretty, modest, beautiful Midot. Loving Hashem, reading Tehillim all day. She wants to convert in one year. Wonderful Goya. You know, like a prophet. Like Eov. Eov was a Goy, Navi of the Goyim. The world Jew in the history that even in hell they don't have place for him. They have to make a special hell for him. It's not, it's not good enough to clean him. And the best Goya in the world, and they're not allowed to get married. Not because we are better than a goyim. No, that's not the reason. Because she's a million times better than him. She goes to heaven of the goyim. She keeps the seven law. Or the goy. Sometimes the goy is tzaddik. Doesn't believe in Christianity or in any idol. He keeps the seven law of Noah. Very big tzaddik, the goy. The goy go to heaven. The, the Jewish girl doesn't go. Doesn't have a share to the world to come. She doesn't keep Shabbat. She doesn't keep mitzvot. He's much better than her. But she's not allowed to marry him. And if you ask Hashem, Hashem, who is better here? 
He said the Goy or the Goya, a million times better than the Jew. He's still not allowed to marry them. It's one of the biggest crimes in the history of the Torah. You betrayed Hashem. Hashem say, I chose you to be my family, my nation. No one from the outside is allowed. Unless if the first convert to Judaism and the 100% kosher Jews, they keep the mitzvot, then the 100% Jewish. No problem. Then they can marry a Jew. Not a Kohen, though, but a Jew. The problem today is that some of the Israelis, or the Bukharian, or the Kafkazi, or the Persian, they marry Goyim. And when you ask them, how do you do such a thing? What does he say? I dated few Jewish girls. Everyone was bad until I met this Puerto Rican girl. She doesn't have demands. Just give me a basement. I don't need a car. I'll get on a bus. As long as you take me, I'm happy. But every Jew that I dated, she wants a house in Great Neck. She wants a house in Miami for the summer, I mean for the winter. She wants a Mercedes. She wants a 10 carat diamond gold. You know, all the, all the stories. Wow, do you want me to marry a Jew when I have Christine, everything so easy, Sylvia, como esta senor? What do you want? Why? Why should I marry her? Look, she doesn't have any demand. Look how she takes care of me, right? He has a good answer, no? It doesn't matter. It has nothing to do. Hashem, what, do you think Hashem didn't know that some of these goyot will be good wives? He didn't know that some of them will not have any demands? Of course Hashem knew. But Hashem knew everything. Everything you may come and say, Hashem already knew. And what did he write? Not allowed. Now I'll tell you a story and we'll finish with that. One time I get a call from Florida. Florida. The name of the guy, without saying the name, but he was a Cohen. Israeli Cohen. Cohen. He calls me up. Rabbi, arasta li tachayim. You ruined my life. I say, why? Chaz v'chalila, what happened? He say, listen, I'm married to a Sicilian Italian girl, Goya. And he's a Kohen. <laughs> and now we watch your debate with the priest. After she watched the debate, she watched another one of your lecture, and she just realized that Jews are not allowed to marry non-Jews. So she told me, my dear husband, I love you very much. They even have a kid. You know I love you very much. If it was up to me, I would be married to you forever, but I don't want to get God angry. If a Jew is not allowed to be married to me, how can I go every day against God? So I said to him, no, and what did you say? He said, I don't want to get divorced. I said to him, I don't get it. Instead of you saying to her, darling, I'm so sorry, how can I go against Hashem? I mean, no matter how much I love you, but Hashem told me I cannot marry you, especially me, I'm a Kohen from the family of Moshe and Aaron, the royal family. So he said, I, I wanted to her to go to convert, but I'm a Kohen, it won't help. Kohen cannot marry a convert. So now I have to get divorced. So I said to him, why don't you come to Monsi to the yeshiva for a month? Let's teach you a little bit what does it mean to be a Jew, a Kohen. I wish I can. If I'm going to come, I'm going to get fired. That was the end of it. He hang up the phone. Maybe a year or two later, I get an email. My name is such and such. Remember that two years ago or one year ago, my husband called you and he said this and this and that. So I decided regardless that I must convert after I saw your debate and the Torah and science, I couldn't stay non-Jew. <clears throat> so I, I really wanted to be married to my husband. So I asked the rabbis if there is any way that I can, there is any way around the law that I can stay married to him. They told me, only if you check your history and you find that your mother or grandmother or grand-grandmother from the mother's side was Jewish, it makes your mother and your grandma, everyone is Jewish, therefore you're Jewish. So all we have to do is teach you the halachot, and we do conversion from the safek just in case, and we do it. But other than that, she started an investigation. She went to the Bed Din Agadol in Yerushalayim, the best Bed Din. They gave her a letter that after checking all the evidence, she's 100% Jewish. Oh. 
Now, back then, they had two kids already. They bought goy, uh, Jews. They don't, need, they don't have to convert. They bought Jews. But they were, that story had a happy end. But, but look at this girl that when she heard that she, is a, she thinks she's a Goya, she's not allowed right away. She said, I'm giving up my love. I'm giving up my child. I, may, raise him as a Jew, she said. And right, you see, we have to learn from her. From her. We, she thought she's a, Hashem, she's a Jewish neshama, but there's also goyim like that. I have, I have, if you read some of the letters the goyim sent to me, I tell them, you want to convert? I give them a list of books to read. Two weeks later, I read everything. Two weeks, you finish, you can test me on any question. Don't waste a minute. Right away, you cannot, Rabbi, when will I be a Jew already? So relax, after Pesach. No, no, it's too long. Is there any way to do it before? Relax, it doesn't go from today to tomorrow. Why? You should see, I'm telling you, so I get letters from Philippines, from Ghana, from Arab Saudi, Saudi Arabia. I'm going to move anywhere in the world. One of them moved to university in London, in Manchester, I'm sorry. He moved from, he finished 12th grade. He discovered me when he was in 11th grade. And he, now he wants to become Jewish, but in Saudi Arabia there's no way to be Jewish. So he said to his father, I'm finishing 12th grade, I want to go to university in Manchester. Why? Over there he already is in touch with the bed dean. Uh, he wants to convert. In the meantime, he learns everything I told him. He writes to me every once in a while while he was in 12th grade. You have no idea how much I suffered this year sitting in a class and listening to all this Islam nonsense, knowing it's all nonsense. How much I have to suffer that I, my, my father would agree to send me to England for university, which will be a cover-up for me to go and become a Jew. You understand? How much people are willing to sacrifice? We have to learn. Like I say that when I started my speech here today, we have to learn from other people. We don't want to try again and fail and then pay the price. Learn from his failure. Learn from good people. Learn from bad people. From both you can learn. Learn from someone who became tzaddik. You know, I was in Los Angeles a few months ago. When I was in Los Angeles, I've been there more than 20 times. The last time I was there, I stayed by my friend, Israel Gad. Very good guy, Afghani Jew. He lives over there in Pico, Robertson, next to Beverly Hills over there. When I was by his house, one hour before my lecture started, he asked me, do you have half an hour to meet my friend and his son? They really want to meet you. I said to him, you know, it's very tight now. The lecture is supposed to start. He said, it's going to be quick. The father and the son came. I spoke to the son 15 to 20 minutes. Yeah. That's all. I told him, I want you to come to Monsi to the yeshiva. And he had a business. He had a business on his own. He said, I'm willing to do it. I said, come to the yeshiva. A week or two, he came to the yeshiva. He finished all his uh, errands. He closed what he closed, he sold his equipment, whatever he had. He arrived to the yeshiva. In one and a half months that he's in yeshiva, became number one in yeshiva. The rabbi that teach him told him in all his life, he never saw someone that did what he did in a month and a half, in less than six months. Everybody else, just to learn what he already know, taking minimum six months. This guy in one and a half months, even though he never learned in his life Gemara, you should see how he learned Gemara. He knows all the Aramic words. He knows how the Gemara is. He knows the Kushiot. He knows the answer. He remembers all the opinions by heart. From what I heard on a recording, how he learned Gemara, sounds like he learned three years already. People here that go to Daf Yomi 20 years don't, don't, don't know what he knows based on this recording in one and a half months in Yeshiva. I called my friend today, I told him, Israel, this is your schut, you brought this boy, perfect midot, he's going to be one of the big rabbis one day, no question about it. And my friend is already set for eternity, for bringing that neshama, that's it. I told him, Israel, I should see how he was happy. He was happy like you called someone right now and tell him you just made $10 million. That's how he was happy. And you see from how a person is happy when it comes to mitzvah, how he's happy so much, then you know he's a tzaddik. 
אה, ברוך השם, ברוך השם, בדק, ביג דיל, so I send the guy to the ישיבה, no. You send the guy to the ישיבה, your bank account is becoming 3-4 מיליון מצוות אקסטרה every month to your account. What do you think, it's a joke? In all your life you're not going to do what this guy does for you in a week. That's a very good profit. Hug Sameach to everyone. Call to.